Um, so this is a tour. This is a meeting about um, uh, this is a meeting about types and sets, right? So I thought I'd, I'd give you a talk that's not typeset. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and also, this is not, I'm afraid, going to be a tutorial talk, um, but I hope that you may learn something. Um, what I've decided to do is actually talk about some work in progress, which might be foolish of me, but uh, let's see uh, what happens. What I am going to be talking about is uh, a topic that uh, um, has been much discussed so far. So I'm going to be, this is going to be another talk about identity types, uh, about so it's going to be a talk about type theory, uh, and it's going to be specifically about types uh, whose elements represent in some way proofs uh, that two things are equal. So I've written here one usual notation for um, the type of proofs, whatever that means, uh, that uh, two elements of a type A are, are equal. And uh, just to recap, right, I mean, uh, the analog in, in set theory would be some sort of indicator set, uh, which would be uh, empty if x and y are not equal, and a singleton if they are, so not terribly exciting, really. And um, in extensional Martin Loeff type theory, it's also... Uh, well, actually, I agree with Thomas Streicher in his, his talk that extensional type theory has had a bad press recently, and it's actually, uh, in many ways, uh, useful and, and good. Uh, but it's not so good here because the identity type is, again, rather trivial in its structure in, in as much as uh, this has at most one uh, inhabitant and it does so when the uh, two things x and y judgmentally or uh, definitionally if you like equal. So what we'll be talking about is the identity type in, in so-called intentional uh, Martin Loeff type theory uh, with its formation, introduction, elimination and computation rules that you've seen flashed in front of you several times uh, in, in different people's talks. And you could say, roughly speaking, what, what those rules if you're going to take. I mean, Martin Loeff himself, as, as um, uh, Michael said, is, isn't uh, somebody who ever wrote, write, wrote down the rules of type theory because for him it was more uh, uh, to, to uh, give meaning justifications. But I'm, a, I'm quite a syntactic guy, so I don't understand something unless you tell me uh, a formal system. Uh, but um, the intention of these rules is, roughly speaking, to try and get at uh, this being the least or a least reflexive binary relation, as long as you take binary relation to mean uh, binary uh, type-valued function. Okay. And what we do know uh, is that uh, um, it's a pretty complicated thing with very intricate and interesting structure. So that might be a good reason to avoid ever thinking about it. <laughs> um, but I guess there are good reasons from a point of view of logical foundations for thinking about it. Uh, there are certainly good computer science reasons for having to embrace it because of the issue of wanting uh, implementations of type theory uh, where, where you can decide uh, whether or not uh, your judgments uh, hold. Uh, and uh, so the extensional type theory has undecidable judgments in general intentional type theory retains because it's uh, uh, weaker, in a sense, the, the decidability. But there's also, uh, as has arisen in the last few years, uh, interesting mathematical reasons for looking at this in great detail, and that's to do with, with this homotopical uh, view of, of equality types coming from homotopy theory. So this is where, and I'm going to change the notation from now on, and I'll, I'll write uh, this symbol and read it as... as uh, equivalent, uh, if you like, homotopically equivalent. Uh, but this is, this is a type, the, the type of, now, well, proofs that, that, that x equals y, um, but from a homotopy point of view, you think of that as being some abstract notion of the path from x to y. So, so um, paths as proofs, I suppose, if you wanted to make up a, uh, um, uh, a slogan. Well, but what, what is a path? actually. So I, I'm not a homotopy theorist. I avoided becoming one as a graduate student by getting sucked into the world of categorical logic, and I've never looked back. Until now, when I find myself having to uh, remember lots of things about those disgusting things called simplicial sets, which I'm still trying to avoid having to think about. Um, but what, 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 what do they mean by this? Well, um, let's be naive, right? 
For me, a path is a function from the interval into something, right? So, um, so if a path means a function from the interval into to the type A, what is it uh, about an interval object that we need in order to develop a model of identity types in, in type theory? Okay, so, so that's the question that I'm going to, to um, address in this talk. And of course, it's not a new question. Uh, you could say that a big part of Michael Warren's PhD thesis from 26 is about that kind of question. But, but the answer I'm going to give you, I think, is a new answer, as far as I know, anyway. Experts in the audience can tell me whether it looks like something they've already seen. Okay. Um, and, and I'm going to, going to say interval object in, in a topos. So I expect probably not many of you know what a topos is. So if you like, take out the word topos and insert, say, uh, intuitionistic zamello fracknell set theory or intuitionistic higher-order logic. So we're not going to use the law of excluded middle, so we're going to be intuitionistic in, in, in that sense. Uh, and topos is just a, you know, a nice piece of mathematics, well understood, providing lots of models of of um, constructive type theory and set theory uh, in various ways. Okay, so but don't worry too much about this uh, uh, if, if uh, topos is, is unfamiliar to you. Okay, so this is the question I want to address, right? Uh, but the reason that it's new is because there's 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 a new angle to get at this question, new to me certainly that. Uh, um, I've learned about in the last few years, and it's, it's Thierry Cochon's axiomatization of identity types, uh, which um, has been around a few years, and uh, I've been aware of for some time as a cute thing, but it's only really with this work that I've discovered uh, for myself, as it were, an essential use. So without this axiomatization, none of what I'm going to tell you would really work uh, uh, so well. What are his axioms? Here are, there are four axioms, okay? Um, so this says uh, that uh, there's a, uh, uh, for each x, there's, there's a, a reflexivity witness, witnessing uh, that there's a path from x to itself. Uh, this contractibility axiom says, well, if we've got a path from x to y, okay, and we look at the pair consisting of the endpoint y and the path from x to that endpoint, there is a path to that, from X and the degenerate path, uh, reflexivity. Okay, we'll come back to, 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 to that in a moment. Then there's what I understand uh, uh, Professor Vodsky was talking about on Monday, the transportational aspect of equality, uh, uh, namely that there's a function that takes a path from X to Y, and if you've got an element of some in, uh, in B of X, where B is a family of types, indexed by the elements little x of a, it, it gives you uh, something in b of y, okay? And all that we require of that transport is that if you transport along the degenerate path, there's a path from that to b. Okay, so um, that set of axioms is equivalent to Martin Lewis' formulation of identity types, except, except here we're talking about something just slightly weaker uh, than what he formulated in his original work. It's propositional identity types, because we don't insist here uh, that this equality is a, is a judgmental equality, something that computes uh, from left to right, but is merely just given by a path. Okay, so, so the computation rule holds up to path equality, up to propositional identity, rather than judgmentally. But it seems in practice that, that everything that you can do with identity types uh, with a, a more strict uh, computation rule you can do with this. So that they're, they're good. But there are interesting questions about the relationship between um, propositional identity types and, and, and uh, the original ones. And there's certainly category theoretic analysis of that. So Benno van der Berg has a nice paper, um, recent paper, that gives, say, couched in the terms that if you were in Page North's um, tutorial, uh, the category theory sort of framework in which you can give models of Martin Luther type theory, uh, you can understand what category theory is needed in order to, to uh, capture this notion of propositional identity types. So it's a form of path object, but it's, it's uh, slightly weaker 
in the sense that some triangles only commute up to homotopy rather than up to, up to uh, equality of morphisms. But, uh, okay. So we're going to work with, with these axioms and see, coming back to the question, what it is an interval needs in order to uh, satisfy those axioms. And if we can do that, then we'll have a nice model of, of, um, of, uh, of equality types. Okay, so we're going to be uh, in, if you like, in IZF or uh, in some topos, uh, in constructive higher order logic, if you like. We've got an object I. Uh, let's give ourselves two endpoints, so zero and one, okay? And um, so that's the very least we need. Um, because then we can formulate uh, the identity types like this. It's the uh, sub-object of functions. So a path now is a function from I to A, and uh, we want the paths that start at X and finish at Y. So if we collect those together, that's going to be by definition what this, uh, uh, what this um, uh, object is. Okay. So the question becomes, what is it about I that we need in order for this definition to satisfy the axioms. Okay. So, they're the axioms. Wait, excuse me, yeah. I, I have a question. In a topos zero in what? Where are I'm you? Here, yeah. oh, there. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were yeah, over yeah. there. In my previous slide. Uh, on previous yeah. Slide. yeah. yeah. Uh, in topos, what does it mean that zero is uh, interval and one? And zero and one are uh, Yeah, well, I, I was undecided about whether to use arrow theoretic notation or not. So I, I mean that zero and one are two global elements of I. That's okay. all. Okay, Just so I have an object I, and I have uh, two morphisms from one to I. One is called zero, one is called one. Okay, okay. so no, nothing, it's bi-pointed object. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's, let's start knocking off these axioms, because some of them are quite easy. Okay, well, the first one's completely trivial because um, we can do reflexivity, right, because we have constant functions. So the function uh, of i ranging over, over the object i, I'm using lambda notation to indicate functions in, in, in the topos. So the function that's constantly x will do very well as a path from x to x. So we don't have to assume anything about i in order to get refl. What about the contractibility? Okay, so we've somehow given, given a path from X to Y. How can we get a path from this pair to this pair? Well, in the first component, we have a path from X to Y. It's called P, right? So, so whatever this, this path of pairs is, the first component is, you know, I can, I can use P of I pretty clearly. But what's the second component? It's got to be a path of functions whose value at zero is the constantly x function, and whose value at one is p. We're going from refl to p. Okay. So what do we need in order to get that? Well, if we had that, right, in particular if, if the object A was i itself, and if p was the um, generic path, the identity function, and x and y were zero and one, then if we've got this, we certainly have to have this. Right, so this is a binary function on the interval with um, the property that 0 and i is 0 and 1 and i is 1. So that's just an instance of this for a particular a. So if we're going to have this, we had better have that. But it turns out that that's all you need. Right? So, so if we postulate uh, the existence of what's often called a connection structure, then we can get the contraction path uh, using this formula here. So let's do that. Okay. So for the moment, I'm going to assume we have a, an object I with its two global elements, 0 and 1. And let's assume we also have um, a morphism from I cross I to I that satisfies these equations. And for symmetry purposes, I don't want to really, uh, I, I, I want 0 and 1 to be as good as each other. So I'm going to throw in the, um, the sort of dual uh, operation as well with its equations. In the end, these are going to be subsumed by another set of axioms, but this will do for the moment. Okay, so, so if we, any object that has that structure will allow us to, to, to uh, satisfy the second of the four axioms. So they're good. So that leaves us really with the transportational stuff. Right, and now this is where uh, it starts to become interesting. Um, let, me, let me just sort of draw pictures to, to get clear in your head exactly what this transport, transportational uh, thing is trying to do. I'm going to call it substitutivity. So that's a, another common name for, for 
So subst, if, if you work in cock or agda, is often uh, uh, used as a standard name for, for this function here. So here's a picture. If we take the family B of X and sum it up over as X ranges over A, we get an object B, a total object, and it's got a projection function down to A. So we're in the topos. We're sort of we're looking at a, a morphism whose codomain is A. Okay. So so here's A, here's B, and we've got say over X. We have the fiber over X is this this bit of of the blob. Okay. And the fiber over Y is that. So what the transportation is saying is if we've got a path from X to Y downstairs, okay, and if we've got an element in the fiber over X, we have to have a way of mapping that to some element in the fiber over Y. So I'm writing that with an infix dot. I mean, this notation is convenient, but of course a bit tricky because you do need to know what the family B is, and the notation is making that dependence implicit, but never mind that. Uh, Okay, so this, this does implicitly depend on knowing what the whole family B is. Okay, and uh, what do we require of those functions? We don't require much, right? All we want is that if you happen to transport along the degenerate path, REFL, then there should be a path from what you get in the fiber over X back down to B. That's what the fourth axiom says. All right, so that's all we need. So if you've got that, then... Uh, you can define J and H, as it were, and get back Martin Lerf's identity types. So that, that's the, the force of the fact that this is a, 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 an axiomatization of, of propositional identity types. So how, how are we going to get this? Right? What we want is some notion of fibration, as it's often called, that supports this kind of structure. But, of course, and this is the difficulty, is that notion of vibration has got to be closed under all the type-forming operations we're interested in, pi types, sigma types, propositional identity types themselves are better give us vibrations, W types are better give us vibrations. So, so the difficulty is trying to think of, of a good notion of vibration. Okay, and you can start to go down the road that Daniel Kahn began without knowing it back in the 50s, in terms of vibrations to do with filling operations, or you cannot, and we're not going to do that. We're going to do something different. I'm going to pretend to be naive, right, and say, well, actually, you know, why is it that we can't just take this red stuff to be the definition of what a vibration is? In other words, I'll take a vibration to be a, a, a B that comes along with, with functions like this, that, 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 um, uh, of, the, of this kind. Well, the spoiler is that, that being naive in this case works. And actually, you can do this, uh, which is quite surprising, I think. Um, what's the difficulty? Well, there's an immediate difficulty, right? Uh, uh, if this is going to work, it is going to work for propositional identity types. OK, so, so let alone whether you consider you know, whether vibrations are closed under taking pi types or sigma types. We've got to end up with, with our path types being having nice transportational properties. So what does that mean, right? If, if, if I look at the, the collection of, of path types as, as a family over, over the endpoints, X and Y, with, so we've got this thing lying over A cross A. So I have two, two pairs, X and Y, X prime and Y prime. I have a path from one pair to another. So I have a path downstairs from this pair to that pair. So that's a pair of paths a path there and a path there. And then upstairs, I have an element lying over the pair x, y. So that's a path from x to y. Let me call it r. Somehow, we've got to be able to transport r along p and q to get a path from x prime to y prime. Right, so, that's, so that's what the, the transport property has is, is got to give us for this particular family uh, o, over a cross a. But moreover, it's got to do it in a way that if we transport along the pair REFL, REFL, there is a path back from that to R. Okay. So how can we do that? Well, let's first of all just put a little bit more structure in the interval, but it's nothing very deep. Uh, let me assume that I have a, a, a unary function that, that uh, allows me to reverse paths. So that's, that's not a terribly strong assumption. Indeed, I, I'm all I'm going to assume is that the reverse of zero is one, 
and the reverse of one is zero. I'm not even going to assume that the reverse of reverse is the identity or anything like that. OK, so I'm just going to slightly augment the structure that I'm assuming the interval has. Why? Well, because then you see, I mean, here I can, I, I'd like to reverse this path like that. And then I have a chain of paths from x prime to y prime. So, you know, the obvious thing to do is to try and get some kind of notion of composition so that I can chain these paths together. OK, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to get a weak notion of composing paths. OK, it's going to be very weak so that, for example, it won't be associative. It'll be associative up to path equality, which is kind of what you want. Uh, you don't want to be... If you're too strong, you end up with the kind of paradoxes that, that Mike Warren found, that, that you, know, you can't have a non-trivial co-category object in a topos without it being degenerate and so on. So you have to tread very carefully and not assume too much. Um, but that's what we're going to aim for. Uh, uh, OK. So how do we compose paths, right? Well, if you, just, if you know any, any, if you've ever done any algebraic topology, right, I mean, if we're talking about paths on the actual real unit interval, OK, then uh, one way of composing a path that goes from one point to a common middle point and then a second path that goes on to a third point is that uh, you can get the composite path which on the first half of the interval uh, speeds up by 2 and does p and on the upper part of the interval uh, speeds up by 2i minus 1 and does q. OK, so, so these two things fit together at one half and give you a, a well-defined function from 0 to 1. So it's p on the first half and q on the second half. So that, that's certainly a way of getting, you know, in the real world, as it were, uh, a path from, from p0 to q1. Now, OK, so let's just abstract a little, right? What, what, what have we actually got here? So we've got two functions. I'll call it uh, up arrow and down arrow, right? So up arrow of i is this function. So it, it's it's 2i on the first half of the interval, and then it's just constantly 1 on the second half. Down arrow is constantly 0 on the first half, and then it's 2i minus 1 on the second. So actually, this definition in the concrete case is that uh, the composite path, it's p of up arrow on the bit where down arrow is 0, and it's q of down arrow on the bit where up arrow of i is 1. Right, OK. So let's take that and run with it. OK, let's assume we have two unary functions on the interval. And all I'm going to assume is that uh, they fix the endpoints. And I'm going to assume this. OK, so this is the crucial step. That um, where down arrow of i is 0 and where up arrow i is 1, that those two things cover. So, so for, for everything in the interval, it's either one or the other holds. We're, we're being constructive here, so there's no law of excluded middle, so I can't say you know, either one holds and the other doesn't, or vice versa. But, but I do know with this axiom that whatever I, I have, one or other of those things is true. Okay. So that's the, the picture is that you, know, you don't quite know what up arrow is, and you don't quite know what down arrow is, but eventually up arrow becomes 1, and eventually down arrow stops being 0, and the bit... Uh, uh, whether both of those things happen, there's an overlap. Uh, so, so the overlap might be just one half, or it might be bigger, but, but, it's, but it's not empty. So um, the thing is, you see, I mean, if you just assume these things, then in a topos, or well, in intuitionistic, Zamello Franknall in intuitionistic higher order logic, you can define a function, the composite of P and Q. Uh, th these formulae give you a well-defined function, okay, because they agree uh, where both things hold. So, so I'm going to take, by definition, this composite uh, to be given by, by, by these formulae. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming now my interval satisfies the, these properties, and that allows me to give a composition. Have we done the job? Well, yes, actually, we have. Because, uh, so I'm going to now get this thing by going back along the reverse down R and Q, and I'll compose those things. To be careful, right, because this notion of composition isn't literally associative. So I'll first do P reverse, compose it with R, and then I'll compose that with Q. So we've certainly transported R from XY to X prime, Y prime. The question is, 
do we have the, the, the fourth axiom in this case? Okay, so what I'm asking is, is there a path from the reverse of REFL composed with R, composed with REFL, back to R? Well, if you do the calculations, it all works out really rather nicely, because the inverse of REFL, so that's the reverse composed with the constantly X path, so that's just constantly X. So reverse of REFL literally is REFL. But the really cute thing is that if you look at the formulae for composition, when you plug in P and Q being R and REFL, then that's actually just giving you R composed with the downshift. And REFL composed with R is R composed with the upshift. So what we want is this, okay? And to get that, all we need is a path from this composite up down back to the identity. But up down, that's just a path from zero to one in the interval. Right, and the interval is probably going to be, you know, homotopically trivial. So actually, really, all we need is, is, is some means of seeing that any pair of paths from 0 to 1 in the interval, uh, there's a path from P to Q. Now, well, why is that true in the real world, right? Well, it is true for many different reasons, but a concrete thing would be that, you know, here's the path Q, here's the path P, how do I homotop one path into another? Well, I, concretely, I can, at each stage I, just take the convex combination of PI and QI, and that's going to be this point here. And so, as I vary J, sorry, as I vary K from 0 to 1, I'm going to creep from there to there, so I get a family of paths that take me from P to Q. Okay? So that, that's, that's why any pair of paths like this are homotopic in, in, in the real world. So the, the, the key step now is that we're, like we did with connection, um, we're just going to, to axiomatize some very anodyne properties of convex combination and, and use those, and it'll turn out that it gives us enough. So let me, let me write, um, I'll write uh, I smiley K J, sort of a convex kind of thing, for, for, to, to mean something which is intended in the real world to be this i minus j times i minus j times i plus j times k. So what I've written down in red here are just some very simple equational properties of convex combination, right? So the convex combination at zero it gives you back i, at one it gives you back j. If I convexly combine from i to itself for any j, I want to get back i itself. And if I go from 0 to 1 in convex combination for i, I should get back i. So these are just four very straightforward equational properties. And what's very nice is that in, in assuming we've got that in the interval, we can throw away the other stuff because it's, it's uh, subsumed. So the, the connection structure are just particular instances of convex combination. And reverse is just uh, the convex combination from 1 to 0 of i. Okay, so, so what we're left with is this theory of the interval. Okay, so there are two constants, 0 and 1. There's a ternary operation, which is secretly supposed to be convex combination. And there are two unary operations, downshift and upshift. And they satisfy these equational properties. And this one non-equational, it, it's, it's in what people call coherent logic. So that's the fragment of first-order logic with... Uh, finite disjunction and existential quantification. Here we've just got finite disjunction, so I suppose it's a disjunctive theory, if you, if you want to put it like that. But it's certainly a coherent theory. I'll call that theory IA for the um, interval axioms, as it were. So it's not quite an equational theory. Uh, that would be really nice, but I don't think it's possible. But it, it's, uh, it, it's got this, crucially, this, this, uh, this, uh, this disjunction axiom. Ah, we're doing very well. So the theorem is the following. I'm not going to prove this theorem, but I'm just going to assert that we have proved it. If you start in any topos that happens to have a model of that theory, so an object equipped with these morphisms that satisfy these properties, what we're able to show is that if you take the notion of um, family to be this path substitutive uh, uh, thing, so, so a, a morphism equipped with transport functions, uh, where if you transport along the, the degenerate path, you have a path back to, to the thing you started with. So that, that notion that we were looking at, 
that notion of past substitutive family, it's closed under sigma types, it's closed under pi types. Uh, propositional identity types are path substitutive. Co-products, W types, 0 and 1, they're all um, satisfied. So you, you get uh, a model of intentional martin Loeff type theory this way, um, and apparently a new one. Of course, it might be trivial. Oh, oh just before I get on to that point, I should say that uh, we found the proof assistant Agda to be extremely helpful uh, in, in conducting this proof. So actually what we do is we've developed a proof of this theorem within Agda. So we're not actually working in the type theory of a topos, sir. Does the terminal of this explain this actually? Uh, yeah, let me put you on hold and come back to that in a moment, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, right? It'll be my next slide, right? Uh, so I just wanted to say that, that we have a formalized proof of this. So we're actually working in, I think, um, it's, it's Martin Loeff type theory, intentional Martin Loeff type theory with uniqueness of identity proofs, which I think you heard about in somebody's talk uh, earlier, and quotient types. So there's no impredicativity needed. Uh, we, we, we do need to be able to form quotients and therefore truncation and um, subtyping of... Uh, uh, sub, you know, um, predicate subtyping, as it were. Um, so, so we're working in a in a sort of uh, a version of Agda where you postulate these things and do a bit of naughty rewriting in order to make the computations work nicely. And uh, um, but it's been very helpful because some of, some of the proofs of that theorem are a little bit intricate. I would say probably you know proving that pi types uh, preserve this notion of of, uh, trans of um, substitutive. Um, uh, Dida uh, are a lot easier than they are, say, in the cubicle world, but, but they're still a little bit complicated, and Agda keeps you clean uh, about not forgetting to check all the uh, things that you need to check. So it's, it's been very use useful to use it. Now, get back to your question, right? Uh, of course, uh, it might be that we've devised a, a trivial theory right? uh, it, it, with no, no interesting models. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to think about, is, is there a non-trivial model? Well, there is, because it, 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 um, amongst toposes, the, the, there's a family of toposes called gros topo. Excuse my French. Uh, so they're toposes where the site is made out of topological spaces with, um, say, um, uh, open covers as, as the coverage. Uh, Giro's original gros topo will do. Okay. So never mind what it is, but it provides a model... It's a topos which contains a, a, a model of IA, so the actual real unit interval is sitting there as a, as a grow topos has a subcanonical topology, so the unit interval as a representable sheaf uh, is an object in that topos, and it carries the structure that we need. Moreover, there's no path from I to the Booleans, because that would turn out to be a continuous function from the unit interval to the discrete two-element thing. Uh, there's no path which is, starts at true and ends at false. So we are logically consistent here. Uh, there is a model which, in which uh, true still doesn't equal false. But actually, this, this also shows that, that there are models in which uh, there's no truncation. I mean, so, so in that model, there are certainly objects where the uh, path types in, e in all dimensions can be non-degenerate. So, so we're, we're, we've certainly got something that's non-trivial. What we don't know, and of course is, you know, for many people, the uh, $100 question or the $1,000 question, I don't know. Um, do, do we have, um, um, uh, within this setting, the ability to have a universe that satisfies the univalence axiom? So we're still working on that, but it's, it's, um, it's looking quite hopeful. So the obvious place to look is that the, this interval theory, it's a little coherent theory, so there's a theory of classifying toposes you can take like this, the generic topos that contains a model of this interval theory, the classifying topos of that theory. So that's going to be the place to look concretely, um, just, just like the cubical sets model is working in something which is not quite, but roughly speaking, the, the classifying topos of De Morgan algebra. Um, so uh, I, I'm very hopeful that there we'll be able to adapt, say, one of the hoffman Stryker style universe constructions uh, to uh, this, this notion of vibrancy to get something which is univalent. So far, we've been able to convert 
equivalences into paths in interesting new ways. Uh, but we're still working on whether this goes all the way. So that, that's to do. Uh, um, Andy? Yeah. About your previous slide? Sorry, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, no, even one more? Yeah. So the, um, do the Morgan algae bars give you? I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. So you see, you, your voice appears <laughs> behind me, so I can't tell where you are. So do the Morgan algae bars give you these uh, IAs? No. 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 I don't so think what so. extra structure do you need? Well, it's 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 um, it, it's so the, the connection the, the connection functions. structure in De Morgan algebras is order theoretic, so it, so it's a meet and a join. Here it's 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 uh, numerical. So 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 I meet J is I times J, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's quite okay. a different sort of thing, and I don't don't believe that De Morgan algebra structure can can satisfy <laughs> can have this um, this composition, this upshift and downshift. I just don't think that they exist there. So, okay. so it is, I think, a completely different, uh, different model. OK, thanks. Yeah. You need to switch it on. Yes. Uh, has, uh, has this a uh, universe property, you mean? You mean, do, do, does a universe exist there? Uh, which, which, which universe property has this uh, classifying topos, this question? Um, what do you mean by universe property? Uh, you mean classifying? Uh, if I so, so uh, classifying topos, it, it, it's a technical term meaning that it's, it's a topos that contains a model of that particular first order theory and it's generic amongst all such models. So if I have some other topos with a model of IA, there's a unique geometric morphism that takes the generic one to that one. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's what it means. So it's, it's not specifically to do with universes, but what we what we would do is look inside of that particular growth and topos, look at the hoffman streicher universe construction that takes a a, um, uh, a growth and um, uh, universe in sets and and turns out uh, uh, Thomas is here somewhere. It works for sheaf toposes, doesn't it? Excellent, because that's what we need here. We're not in a. That's the other thing that's difficult, different here for us than from cubicle, that we, we are actually in a proper sheaf topos, not a pre sheaf topos. That's bad because it's harder to do. Yeah, it's harder to, to work with. I mean, I, I don't have an explicit description of this classifying topos, and I'm sort of hoping we won't ever need to. But uh, let, me, let me just try and finish. Uh, um, so, uh, one nice thing, right? So, there are nasty things. Uh, but, but one nice thing here is, well, first of all, there's no can-filling conditions to ever consider in our model, so that's good, <laughs> right? Because the notion of fibrancy is just to do with this weak notion of composition of paths. It's nothing to do with can-filling at all. The other good thing is, is that because of that, um, any object is fibrant, so the trivial family o over the terminal object is, it has that transportational structure just trivially. So in particular, the interval is a first-class object in this type theory, which is you know, not the case in cubicle sets. The intervals are implicit. They're pre-types, as it were. Uh, so um, what we hope is that there's probably a nice, as it were, interval type theory in the same way that there's cubicle type theory. But it, it might be a little bit simpler, because, um, because it is just going to be a version of martin Lev type theory with a particular distinguished object called the interval. I mean, philosophically speaking, not that I'm a philosopher, that does lead one into the question of what is the status of an interval from a logical point of view. I mean, it doesn't a priori seem to have anything to do with equality, and that here, here we are asserting that, that we really want to sort of predicate equality upon this prior notion of an interval. Um, well, that's a, an interesting question in some sense. So let me finish just to summarize uh, what I've shown you in this talk. Um, a particular, not a very complicated, little first order theory of some things that are true of the real interval. Okay. And uh, then in, in the, there's a well-known machinery for turning that into, into a, uh, a topos, which is a place in which you can model type theory and constructive set theory. Uh, and within that, we have, uh, um, and indeed in, in any place where you have a model of this theory, uh, an instance of intentional Martin Lerf type theory with propositional identity types based on this notion of equality as a path and without any use of can filling in order to, 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 to get the model. So um, we have a first class interval type. We have function extensionality for free because if you do path types 
uh, based on an interval, then function extensionality is just provable. Uh, so so that's, that just comes out of the wash without having to do anything more. And we're, we're as I said, working on whether universe extensionality, which is what univalence is about, wh whether that holds or not. So uh, thank you very much. And now you can go and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you for this interesting talk, and now we have like 10 minutes for discussion. <laughs> we will probably no. need that. <laughs> Who's starting? You. Ah, it seems. And I'm next. Yeah, I'm. Too late. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, 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 thank you very much. It's very. It was a very beautiful uh, analysis uh, of, of this of this of this idea. Uh, really learned something today. I I, I wonder. I wonder. I, I mean. Um, so usually we, we, we first uh, consider like a, a pre-sheaf category and we cut out uh, the fiber and things. Yeah. Um, so I would like, I mean, instead of having this sort of sledgehammer of like um, this classifying topos, which I never really understood properly, but anyway, uh, is there, can we not have a like more concrete description of this sort of uh, 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 ambient uh, pre-sheaf uh, category. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I very much hope so. In fact, I have one up my sleeve, except uh -huh. I'm not wearing anything oh. with sleeves. But, um, <laughs> so my, my favourite way of doing cubical things is is to take a monoid of substitution and look at M sets, and then look at finitely supported M sets. And that's actually, from a calculational point of view, a very pretty way of doing it. Uh, but I've never got around to really publishing on that, but. I plan to sometime. My hope is that, that one could do the same sort of thing here. So you mm -hmm. take the equational theory, mm -hmm. uh, you look at a monoid of substitution. It's a bit like, it's not De Morgan algebra, but it's, you know, it's an mm -hmm. algebra stuff. You take the monoid of finite substitutions there, and you look at pre-sheaves, if you like, for that, so M sets for that. And then within that, you cut down to some easily describable collection of objects that, that somehow force this, uh, this disjunctive property to hold. That, but I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. But mm -hmm. it may be that you can just not even ever have to worry about classifying toposes. I'll just give you a more concrete description of something like interval sets instead of cubicle sets. But we, I don't have that to give you, Torsten, mm -hmm. quite yet. But yeah. And then dreaming, <laughs> dreaming, dreaming on, yeah. uh, maybe nice to see that this arises as a factor as a, that's a fi f vibrations arise by a factorization system, right? Yes. Um, I think they probably do, just for general reasons, actually. Um, uh, Paige can kind of, you know, I mean, he here I'm giving you them explicitly as a A to the I kind of thing. Um, but I, I, it would be good to, uh, to identify what the, what the class of... Vibrations, core cool vibrations. Yeah, perhaps yeah. you already know, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. anyway. So can I just answer this question? Yeah. Um, so they wouldn't make a real classical weak factorization system because the lifting of ruffle is not... Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's this quality. weaker than weak thing yeah. where, where the top triangle is only up to homotopy, not up to equals. But, yeah, exactly. But these yeah. have been studied. Yeah, Benno, for example, has a paper that describes the, the category theory of it. So, yeah. yeah. And it's not that far away from what we're familiar with, yeah. Uh, you said, uh, it showed up on your last slide, you mentioned it before, that uh, the, the interval or the interval object or something is a first, uh, the interval type is a first class. So, well, well, what, what does that mean? Is it like as opposed to business class and economy or well, something? Well, well or, or, if, you're, if, you're in, if you're in the world of cubicle sets, right, a, a cubicle set is, is, a, is in, in some context, is, is a, a, a thing that has this can filling property, right? Well, the interval in the pre sheaf topos that envelops cubicle sets doesn't have that filling property, so it's not a type. It exists outside. So, so in, in cubicle type theory, you're allowed to have variables ranging over elements of the interval, but they're, they're parameters, and that you, you, can never, you can never collect them together into a single type. They exist outside the world of the types that cubicle type theory is talking to you about. Whereas here, I is just some type that has some properties. So, so in that sense, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, but I think you were first. Uh, in your theorem, what is the precise notion of model of intentional Martin Luther type theory that you're using here? Uh, well, uh, right, um, I, I use uh, um, Peter W.S. Uh, category with families. Okay. Okay. So, so if you, you start with 
you start with your, your topos with its, its, um, its category of families just being, being, you know, some category of families that's equivalent to the, to the slices. I mean, so you do that in any way that you like in order that you've got the coherence of pullbacks working for you. You can do it in a number of different ways. Then within that, you form the category of families consisting of a family plus the transportation functions. And so that gives you an, a new notion of family. The morphisms, the elements, are just the elements of the underlying family. So that gives you a CWF. You have to check that, that the transportation structure is preserved un, under re-indexing, but it is. And then, then you, can, you can assert things like that the, the pi types that you had, if you apply them to these vibrational families, give you back. You can construct a vibration on the pi type. So, so, so uh, it's, it, the closure under the various type forming operations is to, you have to give the transport functions for each thing like pi types, sigma types, w types. And, but you can. In fact, we, I can show you in Agda, as it were, if you really <laughs> want to see it. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I uh, just... Uh, so, uh, Thomas, I think, was next. I somehow uh, missed uh, the point. I mean, is an arbitrary... Uh, you take this classifying topos for IA, yeah. but what's a, a family of types? You said you have no can condition, but you must have some condition, or is a family of types an arbitrary... Well, it's a family of types equipped with the... Um, uh, let me go back. Well, the I acts on. Uh, with a pass lifting with respect with, with to this, I. right. So, so it, it, uh, a vibration is a family over A, is a family B, just with that here. together with functions of this kind. So and, just and pass lifting, no... Yeah. no. And, 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 and no equational properties required, right? It's just that you've got these two, two functions. I mean, that, that's what's so cool about Thierry's axioms, is, that, mm -hmm. is that, that you're just asserting constants, as it were, all the time. You don't have to say that, you know, you really, really don't want to say that this is somehow an, a, an action which is associative, and that this is somehow the unit and that this should be equal, because that's far too strong and won't get you anywhere. Uh, so this is very, very weak in a sense. And that's what is very, makes it all work, because you don't actually have to have very much in order to have a vibration, and, and so it's kind of easier to show closure of the type constructors under it. Yeah. I just want to... Oh, oh, what, what happens with, with higher identity types? What, what in... Well, it, it's, would it's, correspond it's, to this is what's topics. going on here, right? I mean, if you have, uh, uh, um, I mean, you're at some type that you know is fibrant, then you're going to form the, the path type over that. Then, then the fibrancy structure for that is just given given by the this uh, yeah. uh, this this formula here. So, so, so the, the transport. Yeah, but but is it the structure which makes it how say cumulatively like an. Well, you don't need no. to, right? It's just, you you just, you just uh, if you're at a type, and if that type happens to be a path type, uh, then, then the path type for that type is given by paths, and you get the vibrational thing. So, so you don't have to worry. I, I, I mean, mm. Dana Scott, right, once famously mm. said two-category theory sucks, right? Yeah, so if two-category yeah. theory sucks, then infinity categories like... really, really suck. <laughs> and I, I never want to be, have to really think yes. about them. Uh, because they're so horrid, uh, so you don't have to think about them really. You just you're just doing things, you know, step by step, as it were. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, so I understand how, from the point of view of interpreting type theory, you wouldn't want true to be homotopic to false. Yes, um, but well, that's the, sort of like a least requirement, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but the first set of axioms you gave um, is modeled by the truth object in every topos. Um, and oh, um, my whole theory has a, has a, has a, has a, an instance a trivial thing, right? It's, all I'm asserting is that there are other models that are non-trivial. So I don't, I don't want to put in an axiom that says that naught doesn't equal one. I mean, you could do that if you wanted to, but 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 um, uh, I, I'm thinking of taking the interval to be the subobject classifier, um, and oh. I wonder if that has interesting logical <laughs> implications because, of course, that makes true homotopic to false. I think. In the, uh, yeah, I think it does. Yes. But but yeah. it, but yeah. if uh, put aside the modeling, does it? Does you wouldn't. Uh, I don't think it would work, be unfortunately. Yeah. But but it's a nice idea. Yeah, I'm I'm all for uh, not having to. To 
put in something new if you don't have to. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So the interval in, in an L group where you have division by two should give you such an example. The, interval in the, the integral in an L group, uh, a lattice order group, should give you such a gadget. Ah, okay. And that also connects it to the theory of effect algebras. Ah. And, but there you still have this partiality to worry about. Yeah. So maybe one way to set it up is to start with an L group, then you have an algebraic theory. Take the classifying topos and maybe and take the... the uh, and, and, and then, I mean, you have the generic L group and then just take the interval in that because that would also have the yeah. properties. Yeah. Um, and then it would be easy to take the flat ones so that you actually have something that's Concrete. useful for, I mean, useful for implementation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you, yeah. I mean, this is literally something that we, I mean, embarrassingly, you shouldn't really talk about things that you've only done in the last few months. We've sort of only very it, recently- It's very nice. Only very recently done this, so, so I haven't, there are lots of interesting consequences that I don't think has, has a, occurred to us yet. Right. Uh, yeah. There is I, I need a cup of coffee. Can we? Can we stop? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>